Grace, mercy, and peace to you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear Redeemed, Once again, there are two main doctrines or teachings in the Scriptures, and they are located in both the Old and New Testaments. The law commands us what to do and not do, say and not say, think and not think, be and not be. Since we are, by nature, sinful and unclean, it just follows that we are law-breakers. So the law of God condemns and accuses us. It gives no rest, as its continued requirement of perfection is unattainable by us, and yet it is not dismissed because of this. The other main teaching, or doctrine, is the gospel, the good news of what God in Christ Jesus has done to grant pardon, peace, forgiveness, eternal life, hope, and salvation. This gospel makes no demands and issues no commands. It graciously offers the divine balm that soothes the soul and grants peace, life, forgiveness, and salvation. Today's sermon is based on the gospel reading assigned to the church for this day. You heard it read a few moments ago, and I'll reread one verse. Please listen to Luke 17, verse 10, once again, as we consider the unworthy and the worthy servants. So you also, when you have done all that is commanded you, say, We are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. Thus far the word of the Lord our God. First, we consider the unworthy servants. In doing so, it is readily admitted that there is a lot of God's law being ordered by Jesus the Christ in this gospel reading. Here are a few of those commands. Don't tempt little ones to sin. A millstone and a sea await. Take heed. Rebuke a fellow Christian who sins. Forgive him if he repents. Do it numerous times, as often as needed. And all of that is in addition to perfectly accomplishing everything else that falls under the Ten Commandments. The disciples realize that what the Master is commanding isn't going to be easy. However, they think they can do it with a little help from their divine friend. These men are wrong in this. They simply won't be able to fulfill the law as God demands. They will remain unworthy servants. And it's really no different for you and me. We may know that we can't do what God commands, but we've heard or think that if I just had enough faith, I could, what? Obey my parents the way God wants me to. Or I could control my anger so that it no longer exists. Or I could be healed of this disease if I just had enough faith. Then things begin to cascade as I realize my sins in not respecting the authorities, whether in the parental, governmental, and or national realms. I discover my anger issues are not resolving and perhaps only getting worse. Then there are those nasty thoughts that arise and the availability of the internet only makes things worse for me. Oh, and that disease? It's progressing. And the mind of man continues to be overwhelmed, and despair is just down the road. So the apostles make a request, petitioning God to increase their faith. The apostles are wrong-headed in this, and Jesus points out that if they had faith just the size of a tiny, tiny mustard seed, they could transplant full-grown trees. The soul reasons within itself, I need greater faith to do what God requires. The soul pleads to God, increase my faith. But it doesn't appear that he will. Perhaps God doesn't even hear my prayer or doesn't love me. Would a 10-step program to a better prayer life help? Maybe I need to do more and try harder. And finally, the result of this quicksand life is despair that robs a soul of life. You see, man's faith doesn't help the law of God issue. The law is still expected to be fulfilled. But primarily, the Holy Spirit-given gift of faith that comes via the word of the gospel is not of the law. It is, as said, a gospel gift, part of the good news. And here is the really startling reality. The person who is brought to Christ and is a Christian 
perceives the reality that he or she is a greater sinner than before. But there's more. The Christian learns more about what the scriptures declare, and this results in a greater awareness of just how far from fulfilling the law he or she is, or how much he or she is an unworthy servant of Christ Jesus. Here's a perfect example of this. Previously, Jesus said, You have heard that it was said to the men of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother shall be liable to the council, and whoever says, You fool, shall be liable to the hell of fire. You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, that has ramped up the intent, weight, force, and magnitude of the law of God for us. Realizing this is stunning for the Christian. The realization of this is demonstrated by what the Apostle Paul confessed in his letter to the Romans. Here's what he said. What shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I should not have known sin. I should not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, You shall not covet. But sin, finding opportunity in that commandment, wrought in me all kinds of covetousness. Apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. The very commandment which promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, finding opportunity in the commandment, deceived me and by it killed me. Jesus summarizes what he has been teaching his disciples with an example quite familiar to the people of those times, that of the expectation and duties that a master had for his slave or servant. Now, admittedly, that's a bit foreign to us, but Jesus is teaching a basic truth, and we do well to hear him. He said, Will any one of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he has come in from the field, Come at once and sit down at table? Will he not rather say to him, Prepare supper for me, and gird yourself and serve me till I eat and drink, and afterward you shall eat and drink. Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? The understood answer is, no, the servant serves the master. That's the way it is under the law, whether it is the law of God or the laws of men. The master is served by the slave. Here's the conclusion spoken by the Son of God. So you also, when you have done all that is commanded you, say, We are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. Now, if that's all there is, we could just end this sermon right here and now. But this is a Christian sermon, and that means there's another part to this. We've pretty well nailed down the unworthy servants part. Now comes the other part, the gospel part, the good news part, where we behold the worthy servant. The Christ turns everything upside down. He switches places with us, and not only for us only, but also for the whole world. Jesus takes his own word on this. He said of himself that the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus came for you, that you might be well served in the gracious gifts of God, eternal life, salvation, peace with God, forgiveness of all your sins, the sure and certain hope of the resurrection. Behold, on the night when the Son of God and Son of Man was betrayed, this Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God, and was going to God, rose from supper, laid aside his garments, and girded himself with a towel. Then he poured water into a basin, and began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. He came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? 
Jesus answered him, What I am now doing you do not now know, but afterward you will understand. God has taken the place of the lowest servant or slave by washing the manure earth crusted feet of the fallen sinful people of this world. Peter objected to this and said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part in me. Following this baptism, this washing of regeneration, the Christ serves himself to his disciples in the Lord's Supper. Along with the bread and the wine, Jesus gives his body and blood for the forgiveness and remission of sins. After the Lord's Passover is fulfilled, the Son of God is betrayed and taken to the cross for you and for all. Jesus, the Master, continues doing what he had been sent to do and to be, the suffering servant and the law fulfiller. Here on the cross is what Isaiah the prophet wrote about the Father's Son centuries earlier. Behold, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. As many were astonished at him, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the sons of men, so shall he startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them, they shall see. And that which they have not heard, they shall understand. So you could be counted worthy as one worthy in the eyes of God. Jesus fulfilled his own law perfectly. Upon the cross, he bore the sins of all the unworthy ones who ever lived, doing so that you would be declared worthy. He suffered the penalty and paid the price so that your sins would not accuse you, but rather would be removed from you as far as the east is from the west. He was forsaken by God so that you could stand in the presence of God on judgment day and be counted among the holy host who are declared worthy and heirs of heaven. And all this because you have been saved by the grace of God through faith in Christ and not because of your works. So you have nothing to boast about but much to be thankful for. And to demonstrate his perfect fulfillment of the law on your behalf, and to show the complete satisfaction for the sins of all people, and to proclaim victory over death and the devil, Jesus the Christ, true God and true man, rose from the dead, leaving behind no stench of death in the sanctified tomb that he occupied on the seventh day, on the Sabbath day, on the day of rest. No wonder we sing, Worthy is Christ the Lamb who was slain, whose blood set us free to be people of God. You may not be worthy in the eyes of others, and you may not even feel worthy in your heart, spirit, soul, and conscience, but your worthiness doesn't depend on how others see you or your own feelings. You are worthy because the Father sent His Son to be your Savior, and because of Jesus the Messiah, who conquered as the suffering servant. And because the Holy Spirit has called you by this gospel and given you the gift of faith in the Lord your God. So please rest assured that you have eternal life, that you are saved, and that you are forgiven of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus now and forever. Amen. The congregation responds with the singing of the offertory, which is from Psalm 51. <laughs> 